UGA went crazy with its X299 dark motherboard. And the craziest thing they did, evidently, was add a real heatsink. The heatsink has actual fins through which the heat pipe is routed towards the I.O. and into another large aluminum block, which is decidedly less finned, but still finned. The tiny fans on top of the board look a little silly, but we also found them to be somewhat unnecessary in most use cases. Just having a real heatsink for once gets the board far enough. And also, the brilliance of the PCH fan is that it pushes air through both the M2 slots and eventually towards the heatsink near the rear I.O. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB Closed Loop Liquid Cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus 3120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake Ring fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. The last time we did an X299 VRM piece was on the Asus Rampage 6 motherboard, the Rampage 6 Extreme. And we found that on that board, it was somewhat easy to cause it to throttle without direct airflow directly over the VRM pushed through a case fan. This motherboard has a few things changed. One is again, that it's got actual fins on it. And then the other is that it's got two tiny fans on top of those. Now, in addition to these is a PCH fan. The PCH does not need direct cooling at all. It barely needs a uh, heat sink on the chipset. However, uh, when we took it apart, this fan blows air through the M.2 slot, which is a separate story entirely. But once it gets through that slot, if you look at the back of the board, there's no place for the air to exit. So it can't go out here. So it's channeled in a way that the air is forced up into this area of the board. And although it loses a lot of its pressure at this point, because now you've made a 90 degree turn, so you lose 30% of your pressure at least, plus the distance it's traveled, even though it's lost some pressure, it's still airflow going over a small heat sink uh, relative to this one inside of the IO shield or the shroud. So these are designs that have been sorely lacking in motherboards lately. In fact, the last really good finned heatsink like this one that we saw was probably on an Asus workstation motherboard from the X99 series. So EVGA has revived that look a little bit and it is actually functional and this board more or less proves it. So the Asus content previously, we found that we were able to get high overclock stable with direct airflow by putting a fan over the heatsink. They were not stable. In fact, they throttled hard when we ran, say, 4.5 gigahertz at even 1.18 volts. And I think 4.3 at 1.15 may have been throttling as well. So that was a problem. And uh, these FETs and chokes and everything, EVGA's basically got the chokes directly contacting and the MOSFETs directly contacting, and they have insane attention to detail. The MOSFETs have individual thermal pads for them rather than a, a long strip of the thermal pad, which in strict theory is better, but that's getting pretty granular and probably into immeasurable differences. Still though, good attention to detail. Now, they've left the capacitors exposed, which is fine. We did end up putting a thermocouple on the capacitors. We put a thermocouple on one of the chokes under the heat sink, and we put another one on one of the MOSFETs under the heatsink, so we're able to take measurements of all three core components. Further, we ran tests with and without these fans disabled, and one test with this fan disabled as well. So we're able to see the kind of impact that the fans have and whether or not you actually need them active on the board or at what point you need them active on the board. Just to recap quickly from the ASUS content, here's a look at one of the frequency charts where we were able to show throttling. So this throttling on the clock occurred because of the choke and MOSFET temperatures exceeding what their safety value was set to in the BIOS. Let's start with some perspective looking at the EVGA board's performance. With the VRM component temperatures between EVGA's X299 Dark and ASUS Rampage 6 Extreme, we've got a chart that currently only looks at results when we're at 4.5 gigahertz with 1.20 volts. With these settings, the ASUS Rampage motherboard operated at a throttle point when no direct cooling was added, nearing 100 degrees Celsius on our thermocouple measurements of the chokes and the MOSFETs. Keep in mind that these are external case measurements and that the internal sensor would read higher temperatures, thus resulting in the observed throttling. We don't know exactly what the internal temperature is, but that's the trip point. Adding a 140 millimeter case fan brought it down to 65 degrees, which is well within spec. It's 
it's way better than it ever needs to be, in fact. The EVGA X299 dark motherboard operated at 73 to 74 degrees on the chokes when disconnecting the VRM heatsink fans, meaning that EVGA's heatsink alone, with zero fans and with no case fans on it, is able to dissipate the heat far better. Part of this is a better VRM, which has four more phases than the Rampage and spreads the heat over a wider surface area. The other part is that the heatsink is thinned, as the heatsink should be, and similar to the old ASUS Workstation X99 designs. The thinned heatsink then connects via heat pipe to another block of aluminum, where the heat basically is sitting, waiting for the PCH fan to cool it off, or it just slowly dissipates and exits the I.O. shield. Enabling both the VRM and PCH fans brought us down to about 65 degrees on the choke, or about 68 on the MOSFET, with the uncooled capacitors at 65 degrees, perfectly within spec once again. This is comparative with the thermal performance of the ASUS board when under a 140 millimeter case fan that's sitting on top of the VRM. Now that we've gotten the comparative data established, here's a look at all of the EVGA X299 dark numbers tested at various clocks. Under auto settings, the fan follows system temperature and lands at about 4200 RPM, for which we'll have noise charts in a moment, and the auto fan speeds stick to around 5900 to 6300 in heavier workloads. EVGA's VRM fans try to keep the MOSFETs at around 60 to 65 degrees from what we can see, but this is still way overkill for VRM temperature. Remember, these types of components can take over 100 degrees Celsius, and the VRM heatsink is enough that we're only 10 degrees over its supposed target of 60C, landing at 73 to 74C, when both fans are completely disconnected. Up to 4.5 gigahertz and 1.2 volts in open air, you could use this board without the fans active at all. They would help in the case, of course, but we'd recommend just running them at lower, quieter RPMs if you're using a hotter case. And again, VRM components can take 125 to 150 degrees Celsius, depending on what they are. Some capacitors are li more limited to 105 degrees Celsius, but even if that were the case here, which it isn't, these are running pretty cool. Thermal scaling has the 4.3 gigahertz and 1.15 volt configuration at about 55 to 57 degrees, with the 4.5 gigahertz and 1.18 volt testing nearing 61 degrees. 4.5 gigahertz and 1.24 volts, which is stressful intentionally to push the board, is landing at 67 to 70 degrees on core components or 60 degrees on the capacitors. This was also accompanied by a fan speed increase to 6300 RPM, which increases our noise to somewhat noticeable levels. Plotted over time now, the EVGA X299 dark motherboard gradually increases in temperature without any fan support, but eventually reaches steady state. It does take a long time to achieve steady state, which speaks to the mass of the heatsink, the passive dissipation abilities, and the VRM design. The 4.5 GHz test with fans enabled reaches steady state quicker and also keeps lower temperatures, somewhat obviously. For a comparison, here's a chart of just the MOSFET temperatures between the ASUS and EVGA boards when at the same clocks and voltages. The EVGA board, even with its fans disabled, does well to compete. Unfortunately, EVGA's BIOS at time of testing did not permit voltages below 1 volt, so we couldn't test 0.992 volts at 3.9 GHz on the EVGA board like we did for ASUS. And here's the noise chart. The fan tends to stay around 5900 to 6200 RPM, which has us in a range of 34.4 to 35.8 dBA of noise. And this is measured at 20 inches of distance. Of course, it's not just the noise level, but the type of noise. Tiny fans are whiny, and that means the type of noise is more noticeable and annoying than the lower words of bigger fans. Running the fans at 5900 to 6200 RPM is nearly entirely unnecessary in our tested configurations, though your CPU cooler and case configuration will also dictate performance. We'd recommend operating closer to 3300 to 4200 RPM, which measured at 28 dBA to 30 dBA with a noise floor of 26 dBA in the room. The fans aren't too terribly loud, but are annoying at the top end, particularly at the high end of the RPM scale where we measured 46.3 decibels. That's nearing the noise levels of some graphics cards at moderate RPM for load level cooling. So this is just a board we wanted to highlight for doing something actually sensible for the VRM heatsink. It's a real heatsink. You can tell that EVGA is primarily a GPU or a video card company because the heatsink they've stuck on here is not that different from the video cards that they make, from the heatsinks they make for video cards. So they've done well with that. The fans are unnecessary 
for the most part, you could probably make use of them in a warmer case, for instance, uh, likely the DG7 that EVGA also makes. But the overall execution of this is, is it's mixes of brilliant and mixes of unnecessary brute force. I would say this is unnecessary brute force. They're kind of annoying once they're really spinning up. You will notice it. They get whiny. But if you manually control it, it'll be fine. EVGA could do a better job here by tuning the fan profile on these fans to slow them down a bit, though you have that ability as well within BIOS. You just change it to either a fixed percentage or smart mode and then set your thresholds manually. The ones that are set right now are pretty aggressive. You don't need anywhere near that level of cooling for open air and for the frequencies we tested and voltages. This is pretty smart as well. There's a story behind this that is perhaps worth exploring later. But the short of it is it cools the M2 device and then it gets some very tiny, often unimpacting temperature or uh, airflow through the extra heat sink over here, which is attached via heat pipe. As far as M2 cooling, don't get too excited about that. You're almost certainly not going to throttle an M2 SSD controller. And if you do, technically speaking, yes, the controller wants to be cold, but the flash actually wants to be warm. And by reducing temperature too much, you technically shorten its life. Now, is it meaningful? Probably not without some serious cooling or low ambient cooling or something like that, but something to think about. Uh, these are, uh, cooling M2 devices is largely marketing at this point. But regardless, the fan here that uses a larger blower fan, uh, radial design pushing air over into that chamber is pretty good and we like it. Buildzoid is analyzing this board for us. He will have a separate video with full PCB analysis and VRM analysis on this channel. And we're gonna be doing some quick memory tests to see if EVGA has fixed their long-standing problem of poor memory clock performance on their motherboards. If they have, that's a big deal. It has every bit of hardware that it needs, the X299 Dark, to approach and achieve that goal of better memory clocks. We just need to see if it actually does. But as far as the cooling, the heatsink is well designed and it's sad that we have to explicitly call that out like this, but it deserves it and hopefully other motherboard makers take note because you know, the, the argument we hear is making a heatsink like this that's finned doesn't look as good. I think it looks pretty damn good. And I know it cools infinitely better than pretty much every other heatsink on the market. I, yes like this one. This is an EVGA X99 board. That heatsink design is awful, but uh, that has been extended now into basically every board on the market, like the ASUS Rampage. So there's clearly there's a lot that can be gained from this level of density and surface area. And, you know, if you really want it to look good, well, motherboard manufacturers, you just put a sort of plastic cover right on the very top but leave the rest of it open for airflow. And then you get a mix of it looks kind of good and it's actually functional. But of course, I think function looks good and that's subjective anyway. So uh, that's all for this one. You can subscribe for more if you like this type of coverage and find it unique, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.